I would like to talk about the Joel II army, specifically the Exodus army. Um, if you're a Christian and watching this, you probably want to watch something else. This is for those who are in the faith, and by faith, they should have seat seats on. If they don't have seat seats on, unless something changes in their life very soon, they're going to be on one side of the battle, but it's not going to be the side of the creator of the universe. Um, and they may not be on any side. They may just be watching it way back from the sidelines. But those in the faith, or some of them, will be dealing with this. So this video is really for those who want to consider and thinking about being a member of that army group. Um, and I'm going to try to define some things here which don't have a definition in the Torah. Specifically the same word is used and because the same word is used for multiple entities I'm going to create my own word for it just so that we can differentiate who is who. Now again, I realize we can't add or subtract, but when they use the same word for officer, and the word for officer um, is the same for over 50, over 100, and over 1,000, over 1,000. So that's the same word that is used. So for us, that's kind of hard to differentiate or who are we talking about and then they have different things that will happen depending upon whether you're over a hundred or over a thousand so that's why I'm trying to differentiate and adding my own word realize these words are not biblical the word that is used there is uh, uh, in 1825 Sarah over hundreds over over thousands and over fifties and just in the event that you think, well, that's at least it's talking about the military, the same word is used um, to apply to the Levites in Second Chronicles 35, 9, 36, 14, Ezra 8, 29, Ezra 10, 5. It's talking about the leaders of the Levites. So it's really a word more towards leader. It's also interpreted as princes or rulers. So because of how it's done, which is basically one of the leaders, Let's try to define that because we want to kind of define how the military unit should be set up. Those of us in the military, we're used to how to space ourselves in rank and what our ranks are. So I'm going to try to use some very similar terminology. And this is, so again, each one of these words that I'm going to use is my own word. And it's just there to help you understand how things will be applied. Now the first one I'm going to use is a squad. Now we know that either a corporal or a sergeant, it should be a sergeant, is running the squad. So we'll use the term sergeant. Okay. Now the reason we do that in military, we have a corporal there in case the sergeant gets incapacitated or is promoted and the heat, then he moves up. We won't have that. Nobody's going to get lost other than through ache and sin. And I'll speak about that before long. What I've shown here is the actual squad unit. And you can see uh, the one there that is, again, we'll say the sergeant. And if you count, he's only over eight men. So the squad size. Uh, sorry, the squad size is 10, so he's over only over 9 men, um, and so he is the 10th man, and you're thinking, well, well, it says he's over 10, yes, but the math doesn't work out that way, and that's one of the great things about doing, um, doing the math and putting up diagrams, you can see, wow, if I'm going to do this and it's going to match up, I have to do it this way, so, and so again, he, he the sergeant is over a maximum of nine people, ten including himself. And that's a maximum, it can be less. So the next issue um, after squad would be a platoon.
And most of us think of a platoon as three squads. Well, in God's army, it's five squads. And if you notice, one of those will always have at least one less person, and that's because of the people that are above them as the lieutenant, and he has to come out of that squad. We don't have um, a squad of 50, and then we just grab somebody else and put him up there uh, because then the math doesn't work because the people above him, uh, they wouldn't be over 100, they'd be over 102. So <laughs> that's why the math kind of works out that way to do it. Um, and if the um, officer comes from your particular uh, platoon, then you would have another one down. So um, that's why things can move up. So the back couple people or the back couple sergeants may only have eight in their squad. Um, so that's the idea of the platoon. Now next after that we have company. And a company in God's army is two platoons. So a hundred people. And those are overseen. Um, and I didn't mention it in an earlier one, but the uh, platoon is actually overseen by what I will call a lieutenant. Um, the company is overseen by an officer. So in a company you have 100 men, you have one officer, you have two, two lieutenants, I'm trying to add them, uh, two lieutenants, and you have um, 10 sergeants. The next military formation that we will have, uh, again, company, so again, name the companies however you want to do it, you know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, you know, Echo, Foxtrot, you know, Delta, we know the, how to do those things from, again, if you're um, having anything with regards to um, United States Army, those are the terms we use for the companies. The next one will be a battalion size, and the battalion is, is 10 different companies. In the battalion, you have 10 officers. You have 1,000 men, and you have one captain. Now, in number 31, they sent out the army with 1,000 people per tribe. So that fits for number 31. Is that how each one is done? We don't know. Okay, But this does scale up rather easily. If you wanted to go from 1,000 men per tribe to 12,000 men per tribe, it's very easy to add one other person over it and you would have uh, 12 um, battalions. So it's, it's scalable very easily to move up. Um, now, there is a factor there, and for numbers, what we have is that if you are, again, the word was serre, but my term for that will be a captain or an officer, they cannot keep the gold. When they plunder, their plunder is given up for the safety of their men. So, um, it's one of those weird things. If you want to actually make money in the, in the um, God's army, then the best way to do that is to um, <laughs> just be a regular enlisted person because that's how you make your money because you can get all the gold you can find. Um, now here's a real interesting thing because we're used to that gold going to the Levites. That's not what happens here. The gold that the officers and the captains give up gives to the, goes to the Lord. It's going to go to the Messiah. So. Um, I will tell you that I have maps of where the real gold treasures are in the countries we hit because I intend to <laughs> get those places. Now, um, and I would like to be an officer or a captain, so I'm not keeping that gold. So, um, and to put it in perspective, I feel it's almost dirty gold because we have a a job to do and one of those jobs is to rescue the exiles from Zechariah 14 and those women are getting raped so 
if I'm sitting there playing around with gold, trying to put more gold in my pocket, that means a woman's getting raped because I'm freaking being slow. So we are not to be slow. Joel tells us we're the fastest army. Thank goodness we better even be faster than that uh, because there's a job to do and we need to rescue people as well as do our job. So, as it pertains to dealing with our job, let's go through what our job is. Um, and you're going to find this in Deuteronomy 20. Most of the things we're going to deal with here are, if you're dealing with the Joel 2 army, obviously you look at Joel 2 and 3, uh, look at Deuteronomy 20, and you're going to look at Numbers 31. That's going to give you most of the information. I'm not going to do, as part of this video, I'm not going to do anything with regards to our path. I did a prior video on um, the Exodus, and I discussed the path that we will be taking there. So if you want to see the path, you can watch that video. Um, so I'm not dealing with that here. But I am going to deal with some of the things that we do. Um, Deuteronomy 21. When you go to war against your enemies and see the horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them, because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. He's going to be more than just with us. He's going before us, and his voice is going before us. But again, they're going to have bigger horses. They're going to have bigger. They're going to have tanks. I intend to have a pistol, so it's not a factor of them. You know, they'll have bigger weapons. In the thought process of, of mankind, but who cares? We've got God on our side. You know, it it's an hilariously hilariously unequal battlefield because we're not losing anybody they're gonna lose them all so you know who cares let's just go for it anyway uh, Deuteronomy 22 when you're about to go into battle the priest shall come forward and address the army he shall say here Israel today you're going into battle against your enemies do not be faint-hearted or afraid do not pay panic do not panic or be terrified by them for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to give you victory so, we have right here, we have a Torah command. Torah commands, obviously, cannot be changed. So the priest is the one that's going to come do this. And if he's saying, listen, the Lord's going to fight for you, trust us. Or, trust me, the Lord's going to fight for us. So this is not a fair fight. Um, then the officers, Deuteronomy 25, Then the officers shall say to the army, Has anyone built a new house and not yet begin to live in it? Let them go home, or he may die in battle, and someone else may begin to live in it. If anybody raises their hand, they get smacked in the head because nobody has built a home because we are on the Exodus. So, But we still have to say it, it's a Torah command. But, you know, <laughs> we'll probably just kick the guy who even raises their hand trying to laugh about it. Deuteronomy 26, has anyone planned a vineyard and not begun to enjoy it? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else enjoy it. Same exact issue. person who raises their hand gets smacked. Nobody's planned a vineyard because we are on the Exodus. We haven't gotten to the land yet. Now, the next one could be a factor. Has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else marry her. That's your way out. That's the only... Well, better not be afraid of something else. Then the officer shall add, If anyone is afraid or faint-hearted, let him go home, or his, that his fellow soldiers will not become disheartened too. When the officers have finished speaking to his army, they shall appoint commanders over it. Um, the captains. Um, now, here's the next part, and this is a plot applicable to what we will be doing. When you go to march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. They, If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. Just to let you know, nobody's going to do that. Certainly not through any of the cities in Jordan. Deuteronomy 20.12, if they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, put the sword to all the men. That is all males. If you have an issue on that and a question on that, then I suggest you look at Numbers 31, um, which is basically if, it, if it's a male and it's in Moab, it doesn't make it. And many of the women. Um, Deuteronomy 24. 
As for the women, the children, and the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves, and, may, and you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are at a distance from you, and do not belong to the nations. So, if it's not a... If it's not our covenanted land, if it's not tribal land, that's how we deal with it. So Jordan is not going to be tribal land. Syria, almost all of it, is not going to be tribal land, although there will be some section of it. Um, and um, when we deal with Iraq, it's not going to be tribal land. Deuteronomy 2016, however, in the cities of the nations the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. So, those are our marching orders. Now, um, Joel 2.11 indicates the Lord shall utter his voice before the army. And we know from Exodus 20.19, when the people said to Moses, Listen, have God speak to you, but not to, and we'll listen to you, but don't have God speak to us or we're going to die. Do you think that those who are in in the world are any different than the Israelites back then? Nobody can handle the word of the Creator, and the word of the Creator is going before this army. So, with that being said, and knowing the word is going in front of us, you know, there's not really any battle. Even just because there's a man on the other side doesn't mean there's a battle. They're all going to be down on the ground in a fetal position. Nobody's fighting back against you. Nobody's pulling a weapon. Now, there could obviously be somebody, but it would be so rare. And even if they do, it doesn't make a difference. So let's look for verification of that. Jeremiah 36. Ask and see. Can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Every face turned deathly pale. Jeremiah 48, 41. In that day, the hearts of Moab's warriors were really like the heart of a woman in labor. Um, and now that's as we move up now at some point in time we're going to come to Armageddon and Armageddon is a cleanup it's the world's greatest cleanup for the size of the battle but it's not a battle I mean it's, it's just other than the battle with the Amaleks and Achan Sin which I'll get to there's no battle in any of this this is so one sided as to be preposterous so, Zechariah 14, this is the plague in which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. You look for verse 2 for those who fought against Jerusalem when they came in. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet, their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. So, um, again, it, it's a cleanup. That's the best way to say. Um, and I do, because I just went through the hard part of this, of what we have to do, and who we'll be dealing with. Let's deal with pity, and the word pity. So let's look that up in the, the Bible and see what it says. And we have Torah commands on it. These Torah commands apply to what we have to do when we're at battle and it has to apply to what we do with our brothers and sisters and if the same word is used with our brothers and sisters how much more so is it basically used against them so when he says show no pity he means show no pity and if you can't do that then either ask God to change your heart and I will tell you without question I was having a hard time with that. I had to ask him to change my heart. So that's possible. You know, it's asking for his heart because it's not our heart. We don't have this type of mentality. But he can give us the mentality that we need to follow the follow the law. Um, Deuteronomy seven sixteen. You must destroy all the people peoples the Lord your God gives over to you. Do not look on them with pity. Do not serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. Um, now, here's the hard one. Deuteronomy 30, 13, 8. And do not yield to them or listen to them. Show them no pity. Do not spare them or shield them. And this is for the people who are our brothers. 
who have done something wrong there, um, specifically um, false idol worship, golden calf worship, we're not going to show pity to them. If we're not showing pity to our brothers who have decided they want to do uh, golden calf worship or Baal worship, you know, <laughs> those who are on the outside, we're absolutely not showing. Um, now here's where we're getting to it with Deuteronomy 13. If you hear it is said about one of the towns the Lord your God is giving you to live in, that a troublemakers have arisen among you and have led the people of their town astray, saying, let's go, let's go up and worship other gods, gods you have not known, Baal, golden calf. Deuteronomy 13, 14, Then you must inquire, probe, and investigate it thoroughly. And if it is true, and if it has been proven that this detestable thing has been done among you, you must certainly put the sword all who live in that town. The fact that they didn't join with it doesn't matter. You must destroy it completely, both its people and its livestock. The whole town gets wiped out. So if the town, you know, if the majority starts doing that, leave the town. <laughs> because if you don't leave that town, we have to come in. And we're not going to have pity because we're not allowed to have pity. Deuteronomy 13, 16, you are to gather all the plunder of the town. This is from our brothers. In the middle of the public square and completely burn the town and its plunder as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. That town is to remain a ruin forever, never to be rebuilt. So, if we can't have that pity on our brothers and those who live amongst us, then when we look at Numbers 33, or sorry, Numbers 31, 17, and the instruction there, then how are we going to give them pity? And we're not allowed to, so again, the fact that you have military training, has it trained you in any way to deal with Numbers 31, 17? And I doubt it has. If you have police training, has it dealt, has it prepared you in any way to deal with Numbers 31, 17? I doubt it has. So you don't have any advantage from having some type of training. Realistically, what you have, um, you know how to march. You know how to sit in formation. Um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Again, you know, most of us who are probably going to try to join have some type of military background. Um, but the issue is the heart comes from the Creator. That's what we have to ask for, uh, is that heart. Um, while I'm here, let's also deal with a couple other factors. Um, let's look at the weapons we should be taking. Most of us, with especially military background, will try to say, oh, you know, an AK, uh, sorry, AK-47, shoot, fire, an AR-15. <laughs> an AK is not a bad weapon either. But an AR-15 is a really good weapon. It's reliable. And it is. It's also heavy. And we're a mobile army. If that's what you want to take, then that's fine. Um, but if somebody decided they were taking a small arms pistol, I would not think that to be unwise. In fact, I, that's what I intend to take, so, um, you know, I'm not going to outgun the enemy. And when you deal with uh, a rifle, we all know that there are two positions that give you an accurate shot. Sitting down and laying down. Standing up does not give you an accurate shot unless you have something to basically move your arm onto. It's going to give you a little bit more accurate shot than a pistol, but not by much. So, we're going to learn, and I haven't dealt with yet from Joel, but we're going to be moving. So, because we're moving, we're not going to be on the ground. We're not going to be sitting down. So, this is not sniper fire. This is a fast army. So, that's why I think a pistol is probably the most appropriate. The other thing is to look at the ammo that is available, because you're going to use a ton of it. Look at the ammo that's available in Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and see, you know, are you going to be able to get um, extra ammo for your weapon? Speaking of which, if you decide, you know, I'd like to have both weapons. I'd like to have a pistol and a firearm, or multiple firearms. You better be taking them. On, you know, if you decide you need two, then you need to have two, and you better have it at all times. You know, we have that from Gideon, you know, to be prepared, and that's Judges 7. Um, 
again, if it's if it's important enough that you need it, then you better always have it. Um, if you decide that I can deal with one, then you always have that one. Keep it clean. Um, now, that was the hard part of this. Now let's look at the great part of this. One of the things that we will be doing is it's not just we're going through this being devastating. We will be. I'll, I haven't even went through Joel yet. Um, but we're also to rescue the exiles from Zechariah 14. The women are being raped. They are our brothers and sisters. They are from the, they were from the tribe of Judah. Um, and if a woman is being raped because somebody is just fiddling around trying to get the last 30 cents from, you know, a coin from somebody that he's plundering, I'm going to smack him. You know, it's just, there's a job to do. Let's get through the job. Let's get to these women because they're being raped and nothing is worth, worth that delay. That's why speed is so much of an issue here. These are brothers from Judah. They are in captivity. Get them out of it. This is the time of the anti Messiah. I'm not doing the study of the uh, anti Messiah in this video, but one of those things from that, if I were, was, would be that I believe Hitler was one of the seven. He certainly had it in for the Jews, murdering them. I don't believe in any way, shape, or form that the next one's going to be any lighter to them. I think he's going to be horrifying. So move with a purpose. Rescue them before it gets too bad. He's going to be trying to kill them. Let's get them out of that. Um, now, for anything that is plunder, and plunder will include people, um, and in addition to the plunder, you also have yourself. Once you have went through battle, if you have killed anybody or touched a person who is dead, you must be purified before you can be back in the camp. It takes seven days. You have to be purified with water on the third and the seventh day. You have to wash your clothes on the third and seventh day. If you have another person, same thing is true for them. They have to wash their clothes. You know, let's assume that you have um, a five-year-old girl that has been that's been taken. She must be washed. Her clothes must be washed. If there's something that you have for gold or silver, it must be cleansed with fire and then washed. If it cannot be cleansed with fire like clothing, then you do it just with water. After that, it can come back into the camp. Um, we have that from Numbers 19.32 and Numbers 31, 19 through 24. Now again, we're going to finally get to the time of Achan's sin, which is on the city of First Fruits. First City belongs to the Creator. It does not belong to us. If someone in this time wants to do something like Achan's sin, realize there's a reason why his whole family was wiped out with this. There's no reason for it. And I will beg you to say, you're going to have 100 cities after this, 200 cities after this, if you see a piece of gold or you see a piece of cloth there that you think this is something special, who gives a crap, you're going to have a hundred times more than that. What belongs to first fruits, uh, which again, yeah, it would be my belief that that's probably going to be Aqaba Jordan. We'll find out which one it is. It's going to be Lower Edom. Whichever one it is, whether it's Aqaba or it's Lower Down, those things in there belong to the Creator. Don't touch them. Let's not, let's not have a situation where another 34 or 36 people die because of somebody touching that stuff and trying to mess with it. It doesn't belong to us. That belongs to the Creator. Um, we'll have more than enough afterwards. And again, if you're an officer or a captain, you don't get to have anything anyway. So what's it matter? Uh, you could actually have the clothing in any other city, but you can't have it first fruits 
Um, let's, and I don't want to go, again, I'm not trying to do the path, but I do want to kind of describe how we're going to move forward a little bit. Obadiah 118 says, Jacob will be a fire and Joseph a flame. Joseph, um, northern tribes. This is obviously when we return. Esau will be stubble, and they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. It is a prophecy. It cannot be changed. It is what it is. Ask God to change your heart if you can't do it. If you can't do it, then don't join. We've got, we'll have plenty. We don't need many. Uh, Joel 2 and 3. Before them the land is like paradise. Behind them a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. Um... Now, before I do the final bit on here, I do want to talk about the other job that we in the Army will not be doing. And again, there are important factors for us. Um, and one of those is that the places of worship to these false gods will be destroyed. If it's a church, it goes down. If it's a mosque, it goes down. And I don't think that will be those who are off, uh, members of the army. That may and probably will be dealt with by the Levites. But we are specifically to destroy them. If it's a wooden uh, idol, it gets burned. Um, we are told to utterly destroy them. You know, if we have explosives, then that would be great. If not, I certainly hope that when we do the Exodus, that the Lord provides plenty of excavators so that we can just destroy these buildings. I have looked at the number of buildings, uh, the mosque and uh, things. And I've also looked at it in our tribal lands, you know, like in Beirut. And there's all kinds of churches. Lebanon is loaded with churches and mosques, and all of them go. Um, in Lebanon, there is one synagogue in downtown Beirut. So one place of worship in the whole country gets to stay and every place else gone. So, um, that's the best way of saying it. Everything else is gone. Um, now let's kind of walk through Joel 2 and I'm just going to go through this kind of quickly. What we do learn and in this faith is every time we look at something we have recognized how horrible the translations are. Joel 2 we don't have the availability um, to look at the Samaritan Pentateuch, but we can look at the Greek Septuagint. And like in Joel 2 and 4, our current Bible says, like horses we appear. That's not what it says. It actually says, like swallows, birds, they appear. And like a vehicle which is stretched out steed, or a vehicle, they run. So a swallow, a fast bird, that's how we appear. We're going to be moving fast stretched out vehicle, I think of a tractor trailer to be quite honest with you. Um, you can put an entire platoon of 50 guys inside the back of a tractor trailer and drive up and just you know stop, let the people jump out and one person per home and you know the truck just drives up the road and another one that's empty drives up behind it and picks everybody back up. That's fast. That's how we should be moving, it's fast. Um, Will we be doing it that way? I hope we will. That doesn't mean we will, but that's how I hope we do it. We'll have an angel there. They'll direct us. We listen. Um, Joel 2.5 Sounds like a chariot. They skip, dance, or leap over the tops of mountains, like the noise of a flashing point of a spear. Supernatural fire. Or, another way of saying that, God's anger devours the stubble like strong nation people set in order for battle. Um, that supernatural fire, that's kind of just, again, God's the one that's doing this. You know, his anger, we know his, his voice is going in front of us. So I see that. Doesn't matter if I see it or not, it's what's going to happen. Joel 2.7 Like strong men, they move quickly. Like a champion, they climb the wall. Great men on the road. The road could also mean moral character. And they do not break from the path. The path could also be a way of living or a caravan. Joel 2.8 they don't crowd their brothers, strong men in the road, through the weapons or missiles. And I love that word that they actually translate that as missiles. They fall on. They are not cut or injured by the violence. 
It doesn't matter if they shoot a missile at us. It doesn't matter if they're shooting bullets at us, throwing hand grenades at us. It's not going to hurt us, so who cares? Move on. You know, our greatest fear in the Exodus is not the, the enemy. Our greatest fear in the Exodus is not doing what the Creator has told us to do. That's our greatest fear. And, you know, we have in the army, we're going to lose 34 or 36 from Aikensen. If that occurs again, and it better not, and that's not Torah, so it doesn't have to occur. But we do have all the other things which are tour, where the camp is cleansed out. And we're going to have about 60,000 lost in the camp. That includes warriors too. Um, so, you know, our fear is not the enemy in any way, shape, or form. It's not pleasing the Creator. Joel 2.9, in the city they run, rush back and forward on the wall, and they run into houses. They... Um, go up into the windows, which could also be defined as holes in the walls. They enter like a thief. So we have our marching orders right here of how we move. Um, and so, again, we've got a prophecy. We have to abide by the prophecy. Um, and again, I don't think we're going to have an issue there. This is really more of trying to, to let people know certain things. Um, looking at the potential types of weapons. Look at your ammo, because you're going to have to carry that. Um, Again, we're going to be in the sand. Um, Jordan, a lot of sand. So a lot of people are going to be looking at military boots. I'm actually looking at trail runners, and I'm going to put a gaiter on them, um, just which is kind of like a sock. And I even may create my own type of gaiter, which snaps on. I might put some snaps on my shoes to snap them on there, just so the sand doesn't go inside the shoe. But something lighter, because we're told here, we're fast. Boots are heavy. We need to be fast. Um, weapons are heavy. We need to be fast. So, you know, keep things light so you can move fast. This is not a war where you're keeping armor on or something like that. That's not our protection. Our protection is the Lord, and He's going to provide that armor. So we don't worry about this stuff. Um, and again, if He wants to give us armor, then He'll do it. But, you know. Don't try to say, I'm going to rely upon my own strength. I'm going to rely upon a bulletproof vest that I've brought. That's just wasting time and wasting weight. You don't need it. It's just constricting you. Speed is the issue. We need to get those exiles and rescue those women so they're not raped. Um, I know that's kind of a longer video, but I want to do that.